So let's pray and and we'll get started. Uh, Father, we come to you this morning to hear your word. We pray that your spirit would activate it in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, Without that, Lord, we are are hopeless, so we look to you through Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are... Uh, obviously continuing our Foundations of Marriage, Foundation of Marriage series, and we've gotten past all the indicatives for the husband and the wife, and now we're getting into the, the next subject, which is anytime you get more than one person together, you run into troubles. And so uh, if you were to notice in the bulletin insert I put out a couple weeks ago about the teachings coming forward, I had it labeled you know, subpoint of foundations of marriage when sin enters, and I changed it to be a little bit more biblical, which is just uh, troubles, because this applies to when there is sin, or there could be a sin issue, because there could not be a sin issue, but the uh, main topic today, before we transition into child rearing, is staying in fellowship and, and forgiveness, and so if you love to think about, like, sometimes if we struggle with certain things. We look to scriptures and like, what are the promises of God? What has he told us ahead of time? What can we guarantee? What can we look forward to? And let's look to the word and see what those great promises of scriptures are. 1 Corinthians 7, 28 says, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. Those are your promises. If you decide to get married, which many of you have, you will have troubles. If you haven't had troubles in your marriage yet, haven't came across any issues that were that you could describe as that was troubling, then uh, it's coming, one way or another. And so I'm going to read first. So then going on, I'll give you a little bit of a context here in a minute, but 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 34, Paul continues <clears throat> in saying, in, in the promise of, uh, if you get married, you are guaranteed to have troubles. Then he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. (coughs) Excuse me. And so there's this kind of like uh, phenomena in in physics and in nature. If like, if I could lift 200 pounds and John can lift 200 pounds, you would think together we could lift 400 pounds. Well, it's like, it's bigger than that. It's the sum of what we could lift together is greater than the sum of of what we could individually lift. So maybe we could lift uh, 410 pounds. Uh, or, or like 500 pounds or something. And so the same thing is true in marriage when you bring your issues, when you're a person and you are, have a sin nature and you bring that to the table. And let's say you're, if uh, a lot of people like to quantify things, so let's say you're at, uh, at level uh, 10 on the sin scale. I don't know how high it goes. So just imagine you're a 10 and then your spouse is a 10. You think you would have 20 level of sin, but it's actually like a hundred. It actually exaggerates. It's the same thing as if we were lifting weights. When you get two people together, your troubles don't double, they triple or quadruple. And uh, if you've been married for a week or more, you know that. You're like, wow, you don't need to write notes yet. Um, but but simply stating what Paul's saying here in, in context, he does, uh, he is commending people not to get married due to the present persecution, the heavy persecution and the inevitability of bringing uh, children into the world after marriage during a time of heavy persecution. He, he advises against that. That's not a general rule for everybody that would go against a large tenet of scripture. If Paul was saying that everybody should remain unmarried in every context, uh, but that's not what he's saying. It's in, it's in the person, persecution. And so, What he's saying here is that the married man has to worry about his wife, his children. He has other things to worry about. He's concerned. It's not like he's less godly because he's not thinking about godly or spiritual things. 
That is his godly and spiritual thing to worry about his children and his wife. And the wife, she is, is anxious or um, worried about how to, uh, uh, how to please her husband. And because her interests are divided, because she should be worried about that. She's a married woman. And it doesn't mean that she's less spiritual because she has a husband and she has to uh, worry about things in that, in that context. And so, but the, the simple truth is unmarried people don't have to worry about other people as much. That's the context, is you don't have to worry. Uh, an unmarried person, you know, when I was single, I didn't have to, uh, I did not think more than 10 minutes ahead of time what I am going to eat or drink. <laughs> I it was uh, 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 um, uh, very nomadic and very uh, 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 hunter-gatherer. What is it? Where is it? And if I needed to eat, if I got hungry, I satisfied that hunger in the closest possible vicinity I could. I didn't think about it ahead of time. I didn't think, uh, uh, I didn't think you know, about a lot of things. I wasn't, my interests weren't divided. You know, but now I do have to worry about not my hunger, but my wife's hunger, my kids' hunger. I've got to worry about a lot of things. And so unmarried people just have less worries in that context. You are not responsible for other people. And so this is what Paul is saying in this context of there, when you have to worry about other people, when you have to, as a husband, you have the responsibility to provide and raise your children and, and grow them up in the Lord and to wash your, your wife in the water of the word and, and, and so on. And, and as a uh, wife, you have to worry about your husband, what he's going to eat and how to take care of him and and other family issues and how to manage a household. And uh, in, in my life right now, we're dealing about how are you going to feed a baby and, and pump and give him medicine and how are we going to get to church on time. And I didn't have to worry about that when I was single. I just woke up and went to church. And guess what? I still got here on time. Uh, so just pay attention to that back door. Uh, it's about time. And so, uh, but if you'll notice, there'll be mostly married couples coming in because they have children to take care of. And, and when you're single, you just don't have those worries of taking care of other, other people. And those are most of the troubles that come into marriage is, is you're, you're, there's something uh, that has to deal with another person. It's not mostly your, your own issues. And so uh, a quick note to the unmarried that you should have a, some of the major things hashed out within a couple months of courting. And so those, some of those things are like, what are we going to do with the kids? Where, how, like, what is our posture in child rearing? How are we going to teach them? How are we going to raise them? And I, I think some of those things should be hashed out within a couple of months of getting to know somebody to see if, if, uh, if you guys have the same viewpoint or can come to the same viewpoint, which would just cause less troubles. Does anybody love troubles? Anybody love, like, fighting with their wife? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Byron's getting married in like, in, like, eight days. Good job. Yeah. Does anybody love arguing? Well, some of you do, but uh, like nobody loves troubles. Nobody's like seeking to exaggerate how many troubles they have, especially in their marriage. Um, um, but you will have troubles, and if you're if you're courting or or you're seeking to get married someday, you should know within a couple months of knowing somebody whether you're going to have a good deal of troubles in in some of the major issues. Uh, like, how are we going to raise our kids? What's our philosophy on various things? And should be able to get those things hashed out. And so nonetheless, uh, no matter how much you try to hash out beforehand, we do an okay job or a pretty good job in, in uh, pre-marriage counseling and saying, uh, like, hey, have you guys talked about a budget? Here's finances. Have you guys talked about this? Have you talked about that? And then they give you homework to go home and talk about it. And, and we do a pretty good job of... of of pre-marriage counseling, but nonetheless, no matter how much you talk about it, there's still going to be troubles. There's still going to be issues. And so, because <clears throat> that's what scripture promises, and, and that's what happens when two people with a sin nature get together. And so, scripture doesn't really give us a fairy tale view of marriage in really any context, except for maybe if you think of the image of Christ and, and the church as his bride. It's sort of, but it's still not fairy tale like, and so we don't get this like lofty image of marriage of 
that is just all lovely all the time. And there's just like, everybody's at peace. And there's just this mutual love and respect all the time. And, and everyone's just happy all the time. And uh, there's two ways to look at it. In scripture, you get the indicatives that we went over, like husbands, don't be harsh with your wives. That's the view of marriage you get. Hey, don't be harsh with your wife. Hey, that, that, that could cause a problem. Uh, or you get the historic narrative we get with, let's just say, like Abraham. That's not like a, no woman, I don't think, was like reading the Bible and was like, oh man, I really want a, a man in a lot of ways like Abraham <laughs> and the other three women. Uh, I don't think that's not a, and so we don't get this like this trumped up, we don't get this fairy tale view of, of marriage that we get uh, out in Disneyland or, or whatever. We get a view of two sinful people coming together and there's going to be troubles. And that the Lord gives us grace and instruction on how to overcome those troubles. And so, <clears throat> troubles don't always mean sin. That's why I changed the, the title. I was going to put, you know, when sin enters, how to stay in fellowship and forgiveness. But uh, troubles don't always mean sin, but they usually lead to sin. And so that could be a miscommunication. I said something. My wife thought I meant something else. There was no sin there. There's no sin in her thinking that I said something else or I meant something else. Uh, I might have been able to have been more clear, but there's no real sin in that or in misunderstandings. But it usually does lead to sin, in my case. It usually does lead to making, having to make an apology or at the very least clarify something and say, no, I didn't mean that uh, in, a, in, in a nice, gentle way, hopefully. If not, then it leads to sin. And so there's, you know, there's other areas, unfulfilled expectations, there's uncommunicated expectations, there's various things in, in relationships that go uncommunicated that was an expectation. That's not a sin necessarily, but it, it could lead to sin, it could lead to disappointment, and those are troubles but aren't necessarily sin. And so if you look at the analogy of a, a, of a garden, and what's the difference between a garden that's overgrown with weeds and a garden that isn't? Is there's no lack of weeds going to either garden. It's not that this, this garden just doesn't have weeds and, and God blessed it and, and it's just, uh, or Monsanto blessed it and it just doesn't have weeds. <laughs> it's, it's this garden, the one that's overgrown with weeds doesn't get plucked doesn't get taken care of. When, it, when there's a weed, it doesn't get addressed. It, it sprouts up. And you look at it, and you know it's a weed, and it sprouts up. And the one that's clear of weeds, the people see a weed, and they pluck it up. They take care of it. And weeds in a garden are a lot easier to take care of when they're, when they're this big. There's not a lot of thorns and thistles on them yet. And, and that's the difference between marriages that have a lot of troubles or ongoing troubles and who, and who don't, is they take care of issues and they take care of those troubles. It's the, the marriages that you, uh, need heavy counseling or, or are way off in left field that have, they, they didn't just start with huge issues, they start with little issues and they grow and they grow and they grow and they don't get taken care of. It's the same thing, same thing like in a garden. And so uh, I want to talk about negative aspects and positive aspects to staying in fellowship. And, and so that would be the removing weeds aspect is what I, what I kind of want to talk about first is things that actively take us out of fellowship with our spouse. And these are principles. These are honestly, I'm applying these. This is not, when you look in scripture, this is not directed towards married couples. This is directed towards people. If these apply to you and your brother, you and your mother, you and the people in the congregation, you and your, uh, your workmates, right? This, isn't, uh, this is about staying in fellowship. And so, but I do want you to remember that for most of us in our 20s and 30s, uh, in about 20 to 30 years, we'll all be empty nesters and there won't be any kids. There won't be anybody in your house except for your spouse. And that's who you have to deal with. That's who you... <laughs> Uh, and then you guys will be living alone for about 20 or 30 more years until you die. And so you should be looking forward to that. 
excuse me, you should be looking forward and building a relationship that causes you to stay in fellowship so that when you're empty nesters, you're not going back and being like, hey, so what have you been, what, what have you been doing for the last 20 years? What's it like, update me, what's been going on? All right, you shouldn't, uh, you should be able to kind of, uh, if you want a fairy tale view, which I just think is, this isn't fair, if you want a, a good biblical view of, of a timeline of life, you should be able to jump back in when you're empty, empty nesters, back to the stage you were pre-children, now you're just like 20 or 30 years older and your bones ache a little bit more uh, and you have a little bit more wisdom. And so you should be able to jump back into that, that phase. And if you remember what it was like being newly married without children, uh, I do, it was different. <laughs> I'll just say it was different. Uh, and so if you remember Stephen Shepard's uh, sermon from last week, the, the primary goal of a Christian is to stay in fellowship with Christ and that mirrors and translates onto our relationship with our spouse, which is a reflection of, of the marriage of Christ to the church. And so staying in fellowship is the primary goal, right? If we think about, well, we got to raise the children, we got to, uh, we got to feed them, uh, we got to get them to soccer practice, we got to get them everywhere, we got to take them to swim practice, we got to do all these things, and those are true, but if you don't do that while staying in fellowship, you've missed everything. Um, and so remember Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that which I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. And so that's an image of what David's writing is. His primary goal is to fellowship, to be close, to be intimate with God. It's not... Uh, Help me, I mean, David does have a lot of psalms about, like, help me defeat my enemies. <laughs> he does have a lot of those. Uh, but he says, the one thing I ask for is to dwell in the house of the Lord, to, to, to inquire in your temple, to gaze upon your beauty. It's this intimacy, it's this closeness that he desires and that uh, through the Holy Spirit gave us as, as a primary goal. And our marriages should be a reflection of what we yearn for in Christ. And so it's very easy to get off course. And, and we know that in our Christian lives, it's very easy to think about all the things I got to do for the Lord, all the things the Lord wants me to do, this, 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 and this, 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 and this. And that's true. He does want me to go out and evangelize. He does, he does want me to make disciples. He wants me to raise my children. He wants me to do all these things. But the primary thing he seeks is, is fellowship. Uh, if you remember the... Um, uh, in, Revelation, the letter to the Ephesians, where they had fought against the hated the works of the Nicolaitans, I think it was, and and they fought against people who said that they were apostles, but they weren't, and they were doing this this great work in the church. Yet Christ says, "You have forgot your first love," mm -hmm. and and so you could do a whole bunch of works, you could do a whole bunch of great things in your marriage. You guys can be operating like a machine, getting the kids everywhere they need to be. They got bathed, they got fed, and they got down by 9 p.m. Great, that's awesome. And you can still be out of fellowship with one another. And so you have to kind of keep that, that course uh, as a primary, primary goal. And so there are marriages that, that uh, have gotten so used to being out of fellowship that it's normal, that it's just normal to be out of fellowship with each other. And at that point, it's, it's much harder to get back into normal patterns of fellowship, but it's not impossible. And since all of us, or generally most of us, have uh, marriages under five or ten years, I don't think we're at that. We can't say that we've, you know, you haven't had an opportunity to be out of fellowship for ten years, because uh, you haven't been married for ten years. And, and so the admonition is make sure you're focusing on that, so that you're not getting out of step with one another, not getting out of fellowship, not creating patterns of, of getting out of fellowship with one another. Because once you go down that road for five, five or ten years, it's very hard to get back in. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And so an example of that is that uh, taking general sins of, of husbands is that husbands tend to get, you know, if a husband gets frustrated often, raises his voice or yells at his wife, and then just, he says, I just need a few minutes to cool off, and goes out of the room uh, and never comes back with an apology, never fixes it, never repents, 
And it's just a normal pattern of, of anger, yelling, I'm sorry, or I just need to, even if it's I'm sorry, I just need to cool off and leave the room. That's a, that's a, you're creating a pattern of, of staying out of fellowship. Uh, another example would be a, a wife who nags to urge her husband in a, in a decision or a direction and then says, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to nag. Uh, well, when it comes to, to sin or when it comes to troubles, it doesn't matter if you're trying or not. <laughs> Uh, same thing if the husband said, I'm sorry I yelled at you. I wasn't trying to yell. Well, that's great. Uh, I, well, you did. <laughs> what are you going to do about it now? Um, or to say, or give an apologies that say, I, I'm sorry, it was an accident. But, you know, accidents don't need forgiveness, generally. And so there are, there are patterns that develop in marriages and in other relationships where you make a pattern and a habit of not being in fellowship. When there's a trouble, it doesn't get addressed, uh, and, and you either make excuses or you don't address it, and you just cool off for uh, five, ten minutes a day and come back, and then you try to come back like that's normal. Well, that, that might be normal for your relationship, but it, it's not biblical and it's not healthy. And so uh, what happens over time in those situations is that there's no real confession, which means, and then there's no real forgiveness. And so that's what keeps us out of fellowship with one another. And so Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. <clears throat> and so generally, our, uh, well, I don't know about, I'm guessing it's the same for women, but at least for me and for, I know other guys, is, is what keeps us from confessing sin is pride. It's, well, I don't want to... Uh, for some reason, us guys have a way of thinking of saying, if I confess my sin to my wife, she will respect me less. Because it might hint at her that uh, I'm not as great of a guy as she thought. And, well, you're not! <laughs> That's the simple truth is, she already knows it too. Uh, she discovered that a long time ago. Uh, but for some reason, I know guys get into this pattern of, of thinking that if I confess my sin, she'll respect me less. But it's actually just the opposite. If I confess my sin, she's going to respect me more. And so uh, it's not like she didn't know that I didn't sin. It's not like she wasn't aware and I got to inform her and then apologize. Like, I got I to tell you about this time I yelled at you and I know you probably thought, I, 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 I thought you just couldn't hear me so I spoke louder. Uh, no, she knew, right? Right? Our, the, our families, our spouses, our children are the ones who know the most about how hypocritical we are, know the most about how sinful we are. And so what happens on, on both sides of the equation in relationships of the spouse that doesn't want to confess his sin and the other spouse that doesn't want to confront it is, is I, I've seen this in, in other marriages outside of our church, and in various relationships, uh, not just marriages, but friendships and family members, is that we tend to make a, uh, like a secret covenant of the flesh where you don't confess your sin, and if you don't confess your sin, and then as long as I don't address it and I don't have to confront it, then eventually we'll go back to normal and it'll just be okay. And we'll just get back to being okay. And, and, and you won't confess it and I won't confront it, and we'll just try to get back to normal and pretend like nothing happened. And, and it's this kind of secret covenant of the flesh that, that people make with each other, where it's not directly stated, but you know that's what's going on, is you don't confess it, that's fine, I won't confront it, that's fine, let's just get back to normal and, and move on with our lives, and, and we'll just, and we won't, well, that's not normal. Uh, that's, not, that's not healthy or, or biblical. And so, uh, if you turn to First John 5, oh, I'm sorry, First John 1, we're going to look at verses 5 through 9. This kind of gives us a foundation of fellowship, of what fellowship entails um, in context of, of confessing, confessing sin. Uh, 1 John 1, 5 through 9 says, This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And so darkness in here, if you, uh, just to give you a little bit of context, I don't think it's primarily talking about sin. It's talking about what can be hidden. God doesn't hide anything from us. He's not, he's not holding back or, or choosing not to reveal parts of him or, or fellowship with us for any reason. He is 
totally in the light. And because uh, he goes on to say, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And I don't think that's uh, meaning sin. We're always going to be sinful creatures. But are we, do we have a fellowship with God where we try to mask or hide our sin or make excuses for our sin? Or do we come to him in the full light uh, and trust and, and reveal it to him? Verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so it says if we walk in the light, and that's contextually talking about saying we have sin, confessing our sin, and if we walk in the light with, with God, if we're confessing our sin to God and to others where appropriately, we have fellowship with one another. We can't actually have fellowship with one another if we don't have fellowship with Christ, with God first. And if we have real fellowship with God, it'll, it'll stream down. And if we're confessing sin to God, and, and that's easy, and that's regular, and that's honest, then it makes it easier to have fellowship and confess sin with one another when we sin against one another. But if we don't, we don't have real fellowship. We could put Grace Christian Fellowship on our sign all we want, uh, but if we don't have biblical fellowship, then it's, it's, it's not biblical, right? And, that's, and he talks about in the context of confessing sin. And, and this isn't uh, a nebulous sin like, yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, you're a sinner. Good. Let's not talk about it any further. That's, that's all as far as we need to go. I've got sin. You got sin. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that did to me or you, but let's just not talk about it and sweep it under the rug. Good. We can have fellowship. That's not what Scripture points out. We're not talking about nebulous, undefined sin. When there is a specific sin, a specific sin needs to be confessed, right? Uh, and, and so in your, in, especially in marriage relationships, uh, there are some particular rules for, for confessing and, and for forgiveness, and that is first being particular. If you yell at your wife, you should say, I'm sorry for yelling. I was angry. Not, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a sinful person. Yeah, we all know that. <laughs> Again, you're not hiding it from anybody. Uh, you, but, uh, and, and so when you confess sin, it has to be honest and without excuses, and it has to be particular. You have to actually say what you're sorry for. Like, I am sorry I did this. It was a sin. Not, I'm sorry I did this. I just... I just couldn't control myself. Well, I know you couldn't control yourself. That's why you did it. Uh, or, or if you could control yourself, you did it on purpose. Just, uh, confess that, right? And, and so if you, can, uh, if you get in a pattern of fellowship of confessing the little things to your wife, when there's real issues, it gets a lot easier, right? Has anybody... Uh, uh, I don't, I don't know if this is even in reality. Like, if you like, were a really spiritual and good, mature Christian kid in your parents' home, and then you, then you might have confessed the little things to your parents. Like, um, I'm sorry. I, I told you I was going to clean the bathroom, and it's been five minutes, and I, I didn't. Uh, and then, but I think every kid has gotten into a point where they're like, they really messed up. And it's like, man, it's really hard. Like, I, they're going to find out, so I better tell them. Uh, and it, it's like, oh, you got this thing. You're wrestling inside yourself. Like, oh, it's so hard to, to tell them. I'm pretty sure they'll still let me live here, but who knows. Um, but if you get into a, a pattern of staying in fellowship and confessing the little things, when there are real issues and real offenses, it becomes much easier. And so on the opposite end of that, of when your spouse confesses, you need to honestly forgive your spouse, which is, is ripping up the IOU. So if you go to Ephesians, uh, we'll look at 4, uh, verses 25, I'm sorry, we'll look at uh, 26, and then 31 and 32. Ephesians four twenty six says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let your son go down on your anger. And so if you had a real offense against you and they came in and your spouse came in and confessed it, 
Your job is to not go to bed angry. And that's on you. That's not on your spouse. That's on you. You're in charge of your anger. It's not easy all the time. Uh, it is easy to get bitter and to mull it over. Uh, and if you... Uh, it says don't let the sun go down on your anger because you could just decide to stay up all night and, and mull it and say, I'm just never going to sleep and stay angry. And you'll eventually get tired and have to sleep. But uh, he goes on in verse 31 to say, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So Christ didn't forgive you halfway. He didn't forgive you with the stipulations. That, <clears throat> you know, with stipulations, he forgave you uh, instantly and completely. And so when your spouse comes to you and, and confesses, and you need to forgive them as Christ forgave you. You don't, you don't get the option to get bitter or angry. Um, uh, or you, it says be angry. And do, you, get, you can maybe be angry, but don't sin. Uh, but you don't get an option to stay angry. You get the option to forgive as Christ forgave you, which is instantly and completely. And so that's what you should be seeking for in, in those, uh, in your relationships. But uh, you know, this is kind of a, a wisdom thing for you guys to hash out in your own marriages, but some sins, you do need to see fruit of repentance. Um, and and uh, in, in some areas, but, you know, for, for heavier-handed sins and stuff like that. But, but generally, when anybody comes and confesses sin to you, you forgive them as Christ forgave you. Uh, and last time I checked in Scripture and in my relationship with the Lord, when I came and confessed my sin to the Lord, he, he didn't give me an earful on the way back. <laughs> he said, yeah, you, you, you better know that that was sin and don't do it again uh, or else I'm going to get you. Uh, that's not how, how he forgave. And, and so um, another rule for, con- for, for staying in fellowship and, and confessing sin is, is that you don't go anywhere out of fellowship. You don't go let people into your house. You don't get into other fellowships. You don't get into other relationships. You don't see other people when you are out of fellowship. And so that might look like, uh, if you ever see it's like 9 o'clock and me and my wife are sitting in my car in the parking lot, it's, it's not because we're having a, a nice chat about what we want to do in the afternoon. It's because we're hashing something out. It's because we're not going to come in here until we've fixed what needs to be fixed? We're not going to come into here and pretend like it's all peachy uh, if we're out of step and out of fellowship. And so you don't let people into your house. You don't go over to other people's houses. You don't go anywhere else out of fellowship. You, if there's something that needs to be handled, you confess your sin. You make an honest uh, apology and, and an honest forgiveness uh, before you do anything else. Because it's the primary goal. You don't want to get into the habit of being out of fellowship uh, taking the kids to soccer practice, taking them to swim practice, going to the church picnic, and then maybe I'll try to remember, like, you know, a couple hours later uh, that, I, that I sinned, but, you know, we've kind of been okay, and I think I can get away with not confessing sin and apologizing this time, so I think we're good. Uh, it doesn't work that way. And so um, you have to do it. Uh, uh, the quicker, the better, uh, you know, in appropriate contexts, but don't, don't, uh, don't come into other fellowships. Don't fellowship with other people until you've restored fellowship with your spouse. And so the last one I have is a, is a if you're keeping track, this is number four, general rules to, to confessing and staying in fellowship. Is that if you fub up publicly, generally it should be a public apology. And so if you, uh, going back to the husband, if you yell at your wife in front of your kids, you actually did not commit just one sin against your wife, you committed as many sins as, as many children as you have. And, and uh, again, your, your children won't lose respect for you because you confess and, and apologize. You're teaching them how to stay in fellowship. You're teaching them how to repent, how to confess. Right? If they don't learn it from you, then where, where are they going to learn it? Right? Uh, and so if it's, a, if it's a public, if other people are involved, if other people are there and it's very public, generally it should be a public confession of, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you did in front of your kids, you apologize to your kids. And, 
and you ask their forgiveness, and you you because that breaks the fellowship with them as well, and so. Uh, and so confessing and forgiveness are the foundations of, of fellowship. Those are the foundations of, of staying in fellowship. And so, but so far, we've just talked about pulling the weeds out of the garden. And, and we need to pluck the weeds out of the garden. But um, if it doesn't take a genius. It doesn't take a, a farmer to realize you can have a whole acre of land with no weeds. But if you don't plant the crops, you're not going to get anything. <laughs> Uh, you can't if you don't sow the seeds, and and so there are positive aspects to staying in fellowship. This isn't just a oh, this isn't just a sin confessing forgiveness thing. That's probably the hardest one, but you have to sow positive seeds in fellowship. And so, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a, a little bit in my notes. And so, real just a real quick um, note on well, let's say your husband. Uh, sins, it's, it's blatant, he knows it's sin, you know it's sin, but he hasn't, he hasn't confessed it. You've got two options, uh, either forgive it or confront it. You don't have an option to stay bitter, you don't have an option to mull it over, you don't have an option to keep thinking about it until he, for, until he confesses it. First Peter 4.8, which quotes Proverbs 10.12, the apostle says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And so you either just cover it up and forget about it. Uh, you don't bring it up. You don't think about it. You just drop it. Or you confront it. Matthew 18 principle. If your brother sins against you, go to him and tell him his fault. Right? Between you and him alone. And so this, God doesn't give us a third option to, to be angry, to think about it, to think about when he confesses, I'm really going to get him. Uh, gives us the option to to cover it, love covers a multitude of sins, or confront it. If, if you can't forget about it, then you have to confront it. And so, um, <coughs> so excuse me, uh, and so going back in, in the garden, you not just need to pluck up the weeds, but you need to, to plant uh, a harvest of, of fellowship in this context. And so this is actively seeking fellowship with, with one another. And, and so you could have, this really is, I've seen this in, in family members in, in various contexts, where you really could have a relationship with your spouse where there isn't much conflict, that doesn't seem like there's very, very many problems, but there isn't much love and fellowship either. There's not a mutual love, not a mutual respect to one another either. You could have a marriage that goes on for years and decades where you don't fight, the kids get taken to their sports practices, they, they, we sit down and we have family dinners together or whatever, uh, and there's no conflict, but there's not fellowship either. And so um, uh, what the New Testament Greek does is, is many, many people know the term, the koinonia fellowship is, I think, best summed up in partaking of one another. And so that, that type of fellowship where... Uh, it's translated various ways in the New Testament besides fellowship, which is even ser is used as service in other areas, is, is what you want to do is fill each other's tanks up. And you should be looking to not get your tank filled as much as you are to fill the, the other person's tank. And so that fellowship that the Bible portrays between Christ and the church is that partaking of, of one another. Christ gives himself to me, I give myself to Christ. And there's a mutual fellowship there. And so we could get so wrapped up in the day-to-day the, the -day things that we don't really have time left for our spouses or for fellowship. And, um, um, and so uh, a couple in the last five minutes, just a couple quick suggestions. This is something where I really do think it's individual for each, each marriage. How do, how do you need to fill your wife's tank? How does your wife need to, how do you need to fill your husband's tank? And you, I can't tell you. Uh, you go and ask your spouse uh, and, and figure it out. But, um, and again, uh, uh, the, uh, what God's giving us in the, in the scriptures isn't a, 
like a play-by-play, -play. this is step one, step two, step three. What it describes is fellowship with the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that is so intimate with his church that they know each other, they spend time with each other. Um, there's, a, there's a real connection. It's, it's uh, uh, like, has it, I, mean, I mean, I've talked to Christians who have maybe converted to Christ or come, come to church for a year or two, and they're reading their Bible, they're coming to church, and you ask them, like, have you ever felt the, like, the active presence of God, like in the Holy Spirit? And like, no. But I know this is real, and, and the Bible says come to church, so I come to church. Like, you know that there's something missing. You know that that's not the way it's supposed to be. And, uh, and so there has to be some kind of, of fellowship, some kind of partaking of one another, some kind of, of connection that happens in marriage regularly, and that should be a primary goal. Uh, the kids get late to soccer practice, that's fine. Gets late to swim practice, that's, that'll be okay. I, I seriously hate tardiness. I think it's one of like the upper echelon sins that you could do is to be tardy. But uh, still don't find a great Bible verse for that one. But, but, uh, but it's okay as, as long as you're staying in fellowship with your, with your wife and, and eventually you know, with your kids. And so that means <coughs> you have to make time to connect. It has to be regular. I can't tell you what interval it is. Uh, we do a weekly date night that's pretty rigid, and even then, it's easy to keep the schedule and do a date night and not connect, right? It's easy to do that. Uh, you have to be very in intentional about connecting and then uh, being aware of the depth of your fellowship with one another, right? We do this in our, in our, in our Christian life, I uh, same thing with the example of you know a, a believer that's coming to church and not experiencing the presence of God. You know, if, if I meet with a young man, I, I ask him, like, "How's your Bible reading doing? How's uh, how's your fight against pornography? How how are you living a holy life? Are you doing something on mission? Are you doing this?" And yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay, are you really growing in your depth in your fellowship with God? Oh, oh, what's I don't know. I'm checking the boxes though. <laughs> um, I read my Bible three out of seven days this week. That's, that's pretty good. But are you making a real connection? Or is there a real fellowship that's tangible between, between you and God? Because <clears throat> it's easy to, to get into the busyness and to forget the first things. And it's easy in our relationships to get into the busyness and, and forget the first things. And so you do have to make time to make real connection, uh, whether that's a date night or just connecting. You know, um, some couples just you know drink coffee in the morning or something. Um, and you need to be aware. Husbands need to be aware of how their wife wants to connect, and wives need to be aware of how their husbands want to connect because it's not the same thing. It's not generally the same way. Um, you know, if my wife watched me change a tire, I'd love for her to just sit there and be quiet and watch. Don't ask any questions. Don't ask what a lug nut is. Don't, uh, unless you can hand me a fat, unless I can say, like, like hand me a 5 uh socket and she can do it, then I'm like, I'm not, probably not going to talk to you either. But I feel like there's a real connection. Uh, she doesn't. Uh, she wants me to, like, ask her how her day's going. What happened? Tell me about it. How'd that make you feel? Uh, kind of thing. And so you have to be aware of how the other uh, person uh, uh, fellowships and makes a connection. And because if it's just one-sided, it's, it's not going to go very far. And, and so those are some suggestions. But the point is that there has to be, uh, when in, a, in a marriage, and this applies to other relationships, in a garden, you have to pull the weeds. There has to be confessing. There has to be forgiveness. But you also have to plant a harvest. There has to be real times of connection and fellowship. And those are, this is uh, kindergarten stuff for relationships, but it's very easy to try to get down the road and, and, and get other things. And so let's end in prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, for your Holy Spirit that in, empowers us to obey your word, that, that brings us in fellowship with the Father and the Son. And we pray that you'd bless the marriages uh, and any marriages here in the future with deep fellowship, with honest confession, uh, and with uh, with union and partaking of one another uh, in the same way we partake of you, Jesus Christ. Amen.